Kiana, good morning and thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you this morning. Can I start by acknowledging uh, my parliamentary colleague, the Associate Minister of Health, Joe Goodhue. Thank you very much for the great work and leadership that you're providing right up and down the country. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for the welcome. And can I start off by saying how much the Government and the Ministry of Health certainly value the relationship that we have with so many uh, NGO providers across the country and uh, we really do value what you're doing. Providers of well over a couple of billion dollars of services, both to the Ministry and the District Health Board throughout New Zealand. So uh, thousands of contracts and it's a really important part of the health sector. So I think today I've really got two take home messages that I'd like to sort of put up front. The first take home message, and these messages are not any different to what you would have heard from Joe yesterday. The first take home message is really the need to work together not just funders and providers, but also the ministries working together and providers working together. And the second message that I'll be talking about today is focus on results, clear objectives and delivery against them and demonstrating that they do make a difference to people. And we're really taking this approach in the work that we do in government because as a group of ministers who represent a, a disparate bunch of uh, we'll work with a disparate bunch of ministries and objectives. Uh, we've really brought ourselves together in the last four and a half years in quite a strong collective, a number of teams focused on achieving results. So not only are the ministers working together, whether it's on the Ministerial Committee for Poverty or the Ministerial Social Policy Group that I lead, uh, right across all the key priority areas, ministers are working very, very closely together. Underneath that, we're supported by what we call the Social Sector Forum, which is the collective of all the social agency chief executives. And that includes you know, health, education, welfare, housing, justice. Uh, those chief executives and their deputies meet together on at least a monthly basis to progress the government's cross-agency agenda. And that whole agenda is set by the Prime Minister's Better Public Services targets. And just as we've demonstrated in the Public Health Service, that if you have fewer uh, deliverable, more focusable health targets, you actually achieve things, we're taking this approach across the whole of the government. And the Prime Minister set us 10 Better Public Service targets, and the whole of the infrastructure amongst ministers and departmental chief executives is shaped around meeting those 10 objectives. And there's a handful of them that are, to, are, are connected with the work that we, as uh, NGOs in the health and welfare sector, uh, focus on. First of all is reducing long-term welfare dependence uh, is, is one of the big better public service targets. Underneath that then comes the supporting vulnerable children uh, better public service target, and I'm taking responsibility for that as the lead minister. And under that we have three key objectives. First of all, increasing early childhood education participation, uh, and that's led by Minister Hekia Parata. Uh, and then underneath that, reducing, uh, alongside that, reducing the physical abuse of children. And this is an interesting example of where we are seeing a cross-agency focus. So reducing the physical abuse on children isn't just a responsibility of child, youth and family. It's a much wider responsibility. And in the public hospital sector, for example, we're bringing in our red alert system, uh, particularly in hospital emergency departments, able to reinforce the need to ask questions on kids who might present with symptoms and indications of abuse. So that's a very important um, subset of the supporting vulnerable children, and Paul is in charge of that. Second, uh, uh, under that supporting vulnerable children objective, we've also got two other targets. Uh, increasing immunisation for young children. Uh, what we know is this is simply the most effective preventative measure we've got to keep a cold, whole lot of kids um, healthy. If you just reflect five years ago, uh, New Zealand had the lowest immunisation rate in the Western world, with huge disparity between Māori, Pacific and the rest of the community. And through a huge focused effort by many of you in this room today, we now have our two-year-old immunisation rate up to 93%, and there is no longer any gap between Māori, Pacific, 
and the rest of the country. And this is simply what happens when you have high expectations of everybody, and that's what we're hoping to translate with these better public service targets. The one area, the, the fourth subset of that supporting vulnerable children's target that the ministers are working very closely on, and many of you will be participating in, is our all of government battle to eradicate rheumatic fever from New Zealand. Incidentally, rheumatic fever has been a government priority since 2001. It became a government priority in 2001 and absolutely nothing happened, excepting more people got rheumatic fever. Uh, and so in 2009, uh, under the leadership of uh, the ministers, including Mrs Turia, we've made eradicating rheumatic fever one of the government's main objectives. It's worth reflecting on the fact uh, that Pacific are 23 times more likely to get rheumatic fever as kids and Māori 18 times more likely than uh, Europeans. So this is a really important issue for New Zealand. We simply are the only developed country in the world with the levels of rheumatic fever that you would see in the third world. And that is why a huge effort is going on. We've got a $24 million project on rheumatic fever. There'll be another very significant boost for funding for rheumatic fever in this year's budget as we bring a real focus on dealing with that. Uh, two other bu uh, better public service objectives that the ministers are working on, boosting skills and employment, which we know is fundamental to good health as well, and reducing crime. Alongside all of that, Paula Bennett's leading the Children's Action Plan, which is really very, very focused on delivering for New Zealand children. You'll all be aware of that. The Whanauora work, again, is bringing the providers together and the uh, funders together as well. And of course, the Youth Mental Health Project is pretty important. So I give you that sort of picture of the work that we're doing in government, just to reinforce the fact that this working together isn't just a message that we want to tell you. We are actually modelling it in our own behaviour as a government and across our departments. So the format of my talk today, I just want to touch on some of the work that we're doing particularly in the health portfolio, to then maybe talk about uh, some issues around contracting that government is working on, to touch on some new innovations that we're looking at, and then to finally talk about an innovation around recognising the huge numbers of volunteers who work with your organisations and ours, and an opportunity we have to recognise those people over the next while. And I really don't want to take more than 10 minutes. I know you'll all agree in this room that good health is hugely important to New Zealanders and that's why a strong public health service gives families peace of mind and knowing that the care that they need will be there when they need it, which is why our government in the last four and a half years has made it a priority to protect and grow New Zealand public health services. We've seen it ourselves as having the task of repairing the damage of a decade of wasteful spending, spending, endless bureaucracy and a lack of clinical engagement. So we're making quite a lot of progress. More patients are getting the services that they need. Our DHBs are employing more doctors and nurses than ever before. And we think there's a much greater focus on preventing illness. We've moved resources from the back office to the front line. We've got fewer managers and administrators. We're harnessing the power of bulk purchasing and our services are becoming more productive and efficient. But like health services all around the world, we face two major challenges. Uh, one is fiscal and the other is demographic. Uh, and as you heard from Colin, our country faces some pretty significant uh, financial challenges, uh, a deficit and growing public debt. And it's worth reflecting on the fact that four years ago when our government was elected, uh, we owed $8 billion overseas. Today we owe $55 billion. And uh, we won't top it out until we get to $72 billion. So our government has really borrowed to protect important social services and take the sharp edges of the recession. And as you know, we're working towards a balanced budget next year, which means a very strong focus on public spending and getting the most out of every dollar. And health is a fifth of every dollar that's spent, so you can see how important that is. Uh, we've also got a very significant demographic challenge. Uh, there's so many more of us, uh, so many of us are living longer, and there's some huge challenges, not only around long-term conditions, diabetes, and things like that, but uh, if you look at our older population, the prevalence of dementia is growing at 4% a year. And I often say to people, you know, if 
your Minister of Health in 10 years' time, uh, look, it won't be me, but uh, it might be Mrs Goodhue, uh, I think the Minister of Health will spend their night, uh, the thing that will keep them up at night, is worrying what we do about all these older people who are demented and caring for their demented spouses. It is going to be one of the most significant issues of health in the future. So public health services all around the world, I think you know, are, are dealing uh, with a lot of these pressures. I don't know if any of you are from Ireland, but the Irish Public Health Service, about the same as New Zealand, they've had to make $1.6 billion of cuts to health in Ireland in the Irish health system uh, in the last year alone. Um, the, uh, more recently, they cut out 600,000 hours of home care and six and a half health staff are going to be made redundant in the next 12 months. Last year, the Irish government cut salaries for hospital doctors. Now, imagine if we did that here. So this is just unbelievable. Britain, the um, health service there, across both their social care and their um, hospital care, are looking to save 20 billion pounds. It's pretty significant. And even across the ditch in Australia, uh, the New South Wales Health Ministry is uh, having to find three billion dollars worth of savings. Queensland hospitals are facing $700 million worth of savings, so there's just these huge challenges everywhere. Queensland is laying off 2,700 health staff this year. Uh, in Greece, uh, that's got so bad that the pharmacists um, can't even provide the patients with medications unless they pay up front, uh, and they haven't paid their doctors for the last four months. So imagine if we'd done that here as well. So there's some pretty big challenges there, but here in New Zealand, our government has still been able to lift health spending uh, by $2 billion a year, and we're remaining very, very strongly committed to growing and protecting the health service. So we know the pressures that you're under, and because we feel them as well, uh, but we all need to maintain that very strong focus on value for money and delivery of results. Uh, as Minister of Health, we want to, and also as, as one of the ministers involved in a lot of the work we're doing in state services, we're expecting all our agencies to be very aware of the compliance costs imposed on people that they do business with. And so we're expecting our agencies to work together. And to that end, there's a couple of things that the ministers have asked the government departments to help with. First of all, we've asked for a standardised template uh, to be developed by the Ministry for Business, Innovation and Employment to progressively replace the plethora of documents currently being used by government departments. And a number of you will be NGOs who are, who are being part of this trial designed to make the contracting documents easier, the reporting and the auditing easier, and we think it will make a difference to what you're doing. The second is the development of what we're calling one-in-one -one contracts with NGOs, which will have a much greater focus on outcomes. One contract, one audit. Uh, we think this is a big step forward, uh, and it's going to take some time to implement, but the Ministry of Health is working assiduously by developing um, one contract between itself and a number of the NGOs that we've got around the country. Uh, our ministry is starting with some of the largest NGOs which, with, with which we have multiple contracts and uh, we're really working to simplify reporting requirements. And I know that um, one of the biggest issues that many of you raise with us as we travel around the country and meet you is the multiplicity of audits and we hope we can do something about that as well in order to reduce duplication and wastage. I was somewhat stunned to find in my speech notes as I was reading them uh, that the Ministry of Health has over 2,000 contracts with providers due for renewal in the next few months. Can I let you know that we won't be able to change all of them uh, to this new model in that time? So some patients will be required. But we are looking uh, for very practical solutions to making uh, the work that we all do together easier and uh, we're not looking for some new world order to be imposed on NGOs. We just need to get some of the basics simpler. And once, uh, once again, it's the ministers have made it very clear that we're expecting our officials to work to come up with long-term solutions to these challenges. And I think it's great as I travel around the country, the willingness of so many to be involved in that and to uh, look at different solutions in order to deal with the very tight financial environment that we're probably going to have for the next three to four years. 
So one of the new ways that we're um, trying to look at maybe some innovations is the issue of social bonds that many of you will have attended the consultations that we've had around the country, which we see as an innovative way of delivering some agreed social outcomes uh, to move beyond some of the traditional contracts and grants that exist. So with a social bond, and, and these are being trialled all around the world, an NGO agrees a, a sort of a desired outcome with the government, goes out and it raises funds from private um, companies, philanthropists, for etc., cetera, et cetera, for example, and delivers services without any of the bureaucratic nonsense to agreed negotiated outcomes. And if those outcomes are achieved, then the group gets all of that repaid, all of that repaid plus interest. And uh, the Ministry of Health has been charged with leading this project across the whole of government uh, and how we might be able to use social bonds. And many of you, as I said earlier on, have been at those seminars. So we think there's some potential benefit in giving this a go. Uh, and I know that a number of NGOs who are in this room are also looking at the potential of, of, of seeing how it works. Uh, it's been tried everywhere. I think it's being seen as an opportunity to give people the power to do a few different things and to get rewarded if it makes it work, if it works, and on the other side, if it doesn't work, we don't have to pay. So uh, it's pretty important. So uh, we'd also like to acknowledge the volunteers that so many of you have who work with your organisations, and that's why we've instituted, Mrs Goodhue and I, the Minister of Health Volunteer Awards uh, to celebrate our health volunteers. And I imagine that everybody in this room will know of people maybe yourself, who fits the bill. And so we want to have these um, national awards to really recognise and pay tribute to so many individuals and teams who support making a difference to health here in New Zealand. Uh, and the health volunteers within health and disability sector do provide very vital support and care to those who need it. And we see this as special recognition of their efforts and dedication. Uh, and the ways in which volunteers assist, whether it's driving people or working in hospices or other activities involving mental health groups or otherwise fundraising, they do make a genuine interest, uh, do make a genuine difference, and it's important that we recognise this. So I'd encourage you all uh, to nominate a special volunteer or team, and the nominations close on the 26th of April. And uh, Mrs Goodhue is in charge of all of that. So thanks very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you today about some of the work that we're doing in government. I hope I've given you a sense of the fact that coming and suggesting about the need for providers to work closely together isn't just some sort of meaningless dictate from yet another minister. We are modelling that behaviour in the work that we do as ministers and those people responsible for public money. We're requiring our senior officials to do that, and we're expecting that to cascade down into the groups that work closely with you. So thank you very much, and uh, I've enjoyed this opportunity to talk with you. Uh, both Joe and I will be here for morning tea, and we hope to talk to some of you informally then as well, but I'd be very happy to answer any questions, give any comments or writing instructions that anyone might like to offer. So thanks very much. So we do have an opportunity for some questions and I'm going to ask that if you've got a question, if you could put your hand up, a microphone will come to you, if you could simply state your name and question and you also have an opportunity to ask questions over the break. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, my name's Leo McIntyre. I'm the uh, Chair for <coughs> Consumer Collaboration of Aotearoa. Excuse my voice today. Um, the question that I'd like to ask is, uh, could you articulate what's the Ministry's vision for a cohesive approach to strengthen our consumer voice across the health and disability sector? Yeah. Um, look, I think it's a very important thing. Uh, the Health Quality and Safety Commission, which we established in 2010, has taken quite a leading role in the development of its own clinician, rather its consumer engagement model, which we hope will be an example for uh, other parts of the health service. 
I think it is a responsibility for everybody to try and engage as much as they possibly can, can with consumers, and uh, we give a pretty clear message on that. Have you got a perspective on it? I was just wondering if, if there's a, an ongoing commitment to an independent voice. I think there's a risk with the Health Quality and Safety Commission's leadership of that, that they're, they're seen as not sufficiently independent from the government. Do you have a comment on that? I haven't put a lot of time and effort into thinking about that. Do you have a strong view on that, Joe? Yeah, we'll take on. We'll, we'll have a look at that. Um, I think there's actually quite a lot of um, opportunities for clinician uh, engagement, uh, but that has to also be matched by a, a very strong commitment to consumers. In the end, uh, it's actually all about the consumers and the patients, and I think one thing our government has tried to demonstrate is the fact that in the end it's providing that commitment to the people who are providing the service that it's all about. And if you are running your business to be providing that level of service, you do need to know what the consumers think. Thank you. We'd certainly welcome an opportunity to speak with you about that directly. Sure. Yes, John Howard from uh, the National Hearing Association. I've got problems here. I know I, sorry. Hear you saying that you're working with other departments. I hope this is going to sift down through to lower than just up the top, because at the present time we're the education and health sector aren't talking together regarding what sort of FM systems they give to children when they go into the secondary school. They are producing a different FM system. It's not compatible with the hearing aids so that these kids are wearing. They don't know that until uh, after some time down the track that they are finding this out. Yeah. Yep, no, thank you for that. I, I, I am aware of that issue. Uh, it's been raised with me and we've had our Ministry of Health people going off to the Ministry of Education to talk about it because it sounds pretty stupid. And uh, so they are talking. I'll have to come back to you with where they're at. But you can be assured they are. Good morning, Minister. Biddy Harford from Kiamanga Hospice and Hospice New Zealand. Uh, I just have a question for you. I wondered um, in thinking, I know that this goes right across aged care and hospice end of life. We are being faced with a number of people under 65 with chronic illness and they are needing long-term care. Is there any thinking in the future about how we're going to support those people? Thank you, Minister. So what sort of people are you talking about? Um, they could well have um, motor neurone or chronic heart or um, those, those sorts of illnesses, not necessarily cancer, but um, there's ne not really an appropriate place where these people can be cared for. They aren't able to be cared for at home. We can't provide long-term care, and it's becoming very difficult to find an appropriate placement for them. Yep. I think that is the big challenge. We've um, had discussions with our ministry a couple of times on what are we gonna do about providing age-appropriate facilities. Certainly with the increasing prevalence of the numbers of those people, there is going to become a, a time when actually a dedicated facility for some of these people may actually be far more affordable than it currently is. Obviously the objective is to provide as much wraparound services to support people to be in their preferred place of living as much as possible and that remains our objective. But I think that you know this issue that you've raised about an appropriate place is really going to be one of the challenges. So you know, I, I think all I'd be able to say is yes, I think you're on the you're on to an issue. My view is we have not got the economics yet to support uh, necessarily dedicated facilities in that place yet, just because the numbers aren't there, but increasingly they will be. 